Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, we're living in the age of NHL Bizarro Land. If we take a look at the standings, the Edmonton Oilers are second and the Calgary Flames are eighth. I never thought I'd see the day again that I would say that. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And Matt, we're here to figure out what the heck happened. Well, you know, it's life. I figure Edmonton's just getting all their the winning season. out early so they can lose for the rest of the season. Yeah, exactly. Like, you look at Edmonton's quality of opponents and... Yeah, it's not very good, so nothing really to see here. They'll get it's... all their winning out of the way, James Neal will do his thing and get that out of the way, and then they'll go back to whatever it is they usually do, which is not play great hockey. Well, the way I look at it with James Neal, he's a third of the way to getting us a third round pick. So there you you go. Know, at least he can be useful for us in some way or shape and form. That's right. The the gift that keeps on giving, right? Yeah. Well, uh, oh, I saw this funny meme today on Reddit, and it was a picture of a guy digging through the dumpster, and it said, Oilers fans being like, hey, where'd I put that jersey? (laughs) Yeah, well, it's they're going to be setting themselves up uh, for some heartache if they actually buy into this, because once they actually hit NHL caliber opponents on a regular, that, that team's going down hard. Yeah, it's good they're getting their winning in now. Yeah. Well, talking about NHL caliber opponents, let's talk about the uh, Calgary Flames week. They had four games this week, one at home and three on the road. Uh, first game of the week was on the 8th of October. That was last Tuesday. And I think Michael Backlund summed it up pretty well. I think it was him on the radio after the first period that said, this is the worst period he's seen this team play in this building. They did not come out playing well at all. They played really bad. They only had one shot on, for the, in the first 15 minutes of the game. And I thought this first period was really sloppy, really sloppy ozone play. Nobody looked motivated. It was just, I I wasn't sure if I was watching the Flames or the Oilers here. I'm going to blame somebody, and I'm probably going to get some flack for blaming them. Tobias Reader? This was all all Matthew Kachuk's fault. I thought you were going to blame our failures on Reader again. No. Uh, If it wasn't for Kachuk, really digging into LA and annoying the heck out of them, then LA wouldn't be basically treating this as their Stanley Cup. Because, like, LA is going to be a top five pick, but they caught the Flames not anticipating a team that's actually motivated to play. And the Flames just kind of embarrassed themselves by not showing up and not realizing that the opponent's going to be up for this game and the flames just had no enthusiasm or interest in the game until it was three nothing for la and then by that time they had to dig in just to fight back well not only that the whole the whole game seemed to be about let's get kachuk and dowdy together so they can face off like neither seem neither team really seemed like they really wanted to come up and play hockey in this one yeah, and it was just a sloppy, sloppy first 30 minutes, frankly, for this team. And then the Flames tied it up just due to the Flames having significantly more talent, and credit to Matthew Kachuk for backing up himself, his beaking of Doughty in that by putting up three points on the Flames' three goals. But... This is not a place where the Flames should have been. And frankly, it's embarrassing that they got themselves in that situation. They have to learn that they have to actually play each and every game. Like, this is the same mistake that got them in trouble against Colorado, thinking, oh, they suck, we'll win, it's no big deal. And yeah, no, you actually have to try. I kept thinking to myself, if only the Flames had a top-shelf sniper like uh, James Neal, they'd have more than three points in the first period because he got four points that night. Like, you know, if only we had a sniper like that on our roster. Um, Second shot of the period didn't come until the last minute of the period. When was the last time you've seen that? I I have seen that, unfortunately, at the Saladome, but uh, it's... Few and far between, but there have been periods like that. Sometimes it's the opposition getting 
skunked like that. Like, I remember one game against Buffalo where they only had one shot. Uh, like, the Flames outshot them 17-1, to and yet it was one nothing for Buffalo after one, because, of course, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, it, things like that do happen. It's just, when one team is prepared and the other one isn't, that's, then the snowball gets rolling, and the it is what it is. Like, the Flames' lack of discipline also did not help in the first while of this game. Well, and, and not just the discipline, say, with, you know, their penalties and whatnot, but you look at the giveaways. I mean, they had 11 giveaways to LA's five. Like, there was a lot of really bad giveaways in this game. Yeah. And a lot right in front didn't... of the net or, you know, even in the offensive zone where they're giving it away and then letting the guys come back down the ice. Yeah. And credit to Sam Bennett for stepping up when given the opportunity by taking two dumb penalties, one of which ended up in the Flames losing the game. Speaking of Bennett, some interesting line changes in this one. We saw the second line of this team being Kachuk, Backlund, and Bennett to start. The third line was Lucic, Ryan, and Mangiapani. And the fourth line was Reeder, Jankowski, and Froelich. And I thought, what a great opportunity for Sam Bennett to be on that second mm -hmm. line. And I'd say by five minutes into the second, he'd already been replaced by Andrew Mangiapani. Like, a lot of people say the Flames don't give Bennett chances, but they do. And then he goes out and screws them up by always taking a dumb penalty or something like that. You can't be giving this guy first or second line minutes when he, he's taking dumb penalties. Yeah, and like last week on the show, I was saying that like the Flames should try him up there because he was playing well in the early part of the season. And that's been a theme throughout his career, is that it, whenever he tries hard, he ends up getting frustrated when things don't go right, and then he follows that up by taking dumb penalties. And it's like he, he can't just continue to play his game his way up and down the lineup. And, like, he kind of psychs himself out, and thinking like being on the second line like okay you're a key player now and it, you didn't score in the early part of the game and things weren't going well in the early part of the game but that wasn't emblematic of just you it was everybody and then he fr gets frustrated and winds up taking the two bad penalties that ended up costing the game and those are the guys and that you it, can't help but limit their minutes yeah, it's frustrating because there is the talent there. And if he plays like Sam Bennett can play, and we've seen flashes of brilliance throughout, like that's why he's still a flame, is because the team is hoping that he'll figure out how to tap into those flashes of brilliance. It's just that when he doesn't immediately get success, he gets really, it seems to be frustrated with himself, and then penalties galore. And we've seen that year in, year out, and it's almost like he has to, like even if he is given an opportunity, not psych himself out if he doesn't score a goal that game. And like just be patient with himself and let things go and carry on and then hope that, you know, bounces start going your way. Well, I don't even know if I'd say it's just scoring a goal. I mean, there's a lot of times he's in the corner and he maybe gets pushed around a little too much and then he gets frustrated and hits a guy the way he shouldn't or trips a guy. Like, he just, he doesn't seem to have the mental discipline that you need to be a top six guy on a top team in the NHL. Yeah, and I'm hoping that he figures it out because there... It, there's a reason why he was a fourth overall pick. Like there is the parts are all there for him to be a very successful player. It his problem is just between his ears. And like if he can figure out how to just remain himself really if he gets an opportunity with better players, he'll be fine. Like the plays that he was making in the early part of the season, he was looking great. But he just was showing to be better than the, his line mates at the time. And now, like, he's rewarded for that, and everything goes to hell. And it's just... It's frustrating, because you want to see the guy succeed, and, like, there's a, a lot of talent there. It's just... 
in some ways, and to... here's a name I never thought I'd say on the show. He reminds me of uh, former Atlanta Thrashers first overall pick, Patrick Stefan. Like, he had all the tools, but mentally there was something wrong in his game where he just couldn't put it all together and be a, you know, a top guy for 60 minutes. Yeah, I can see that. Every game, Stefan would have flashes of a little bit of brilliance where you go get a great goal. Then you go out and do something really stupid. And a lot of people remember, um, you know, like there, there's one time that, uh, what was it? He he had the puck or something. He gave it to Alish Hemsky, and Hemsky scored in overtime, I think. Like, you know, he just... Yeah, instead of just shooting it into the empty net, uh, he tried to walk it in, the puck hopped on him, and... Hemsky took it back and scored the tying goal, and then they ended up the Oilers ended up winning in overtime. And yeah, like he would do, you know. But he, uh, then he scores some sweet goals, and the two remind me a lot of each other in that way. That they're top picks, and the tools are there, and they're great when they have the puck and they can be that sniper guy. But when they don't have the puck or they're trying to get the puck, there's something you know they they're not thinking the game properly. Yeah, and it's subtle, and like if he can figure that out, like it's not an insurmountable obstacle it's just that he has to get out of his own way and i think that's the large part of his problem because like in the early part of the season the first few games like he was one of the flames best forwards and he was looking like he should be deserving of a promotion and just because things weren't going his way or frankly the whole team's way to start you know, he got frustrated by that, and he played himself out of a spot again, and has struggled again since then, and it's just, it's really frustrating, because you want to see the guy succeed. And this game, we saw what we saw so often last season that got the Flames in trouble, where they'd come out in the first period, they wouldn't play, they'd have a disastrous first, they'd get about midway through the second, and then it's like, oh, hey, we have a hockey game going on, we should probably start playing this one, and they'd always come back in the third. And I would say this game, I mean, I'm, I was talking to a few of the Flames and even the coach after the game and, you know, talk of the two 30-minute games that happened, the first 30 and the second 30. Now the Flames are so much better in the second half, but that's a habit I was hoping they would get rid of this year. And this Kings game, it just looked like they were doing the same thing again. They were lucky to get this thing to overtime. Much Oh, for sure. You know, much less to, to end the game, only one goal difference. Like, the Flames were lucky that they could come back in the third, power through that. Get, I would say they really didn't start playing their game to the last seven minutes of the second. Um, and then, you know, to just to be able to keep it that close, this team got lucky on this one. Oh, for sure. And it's frustrating. Like, th this is one of those games where it's emblematic that the Flames are one of the top talented teams in the NHL. Where, oh, we're down 3 nothing. Eh, that doesn't matter. It's just that you're getting, you're putting yourself in really bad positions. And like, this is exactly what happened in the Colorado series of, well, even if the other team scores a goal or two, who cares? We'll get it back. Well, that's not, you want to basically kick the ever loving crap out of the other team right from the get go and just dominate games from start to finish where you're just you've outclassed the other team and you win and like teams that end up winning stanley cups like if you look at how st louis played in the second half of the season or pittsburgh in the past or chicago in the past or la in the past or boston in the past like they are ready to go from the opening puck drop and they just walk all over the other team and they lose games because the other team like, they do obviously have the odd bad night, but, you know, the other team is likely a good team themselves, and they're up for it because, oh, it's a measuring stick, because these are the guys to beat, and... But when you know, those Calgary good teams you're mentioning a... are on, they play 60 minutes of hockey. Yeah, and that's what the Flames have lacked since this iteration of the team after Aginla is that killer instinct. Like, even when we made the playoffs in 14-15, it was the comeback kids. And last year, it was the comeback kids. This year, it's looking like the comeback kids again. And that's and only going to take like you that... so far. I mean, we did see some times last year when the Flames simply ran out of time to come back. Like, they'd get one goal, they'd get two goals, 
and they'd lose the game just because there wasn't enough time to come back. Like, I don't know what you have to do yeah, here. Like if there was a, yeah, like if there was another five minutes, I think the Flames probably would have had an extra four or five wins last season. Yeah, but, it, <laughs> but you know, if you're, if you're thinking that you're going to be number one in the West again and a team that can go late in the playoffs, you've got to play 60 minutes of hockey. Yeah, and that's the thing that I was hoping that because they got fell so flat on their face with the avalanche last season that they'd realize that hey you know you look at the teams that are successful they're ready to go at pretty much every single game from the opening face off right through the the last minute like they might have every team has lulls in each game but they're they respond like when they do have that difficulties either penalty troubles or whatever they bounce back with a few good shifts and then they start going again and this team has a lot of talent but it's seeming that they don't have the heart to back up the talent and that's you know and like this is developing into a team where it's a good regular season team like the early to uh 2010 ish Washington Capitals where they were always the best team in the league but they just didn't have the heart to follow it up with actual postseason results because they they were very very much just outclassing the other teams in terms of talent but not the work ethic and they didn't win until they got the work ethic and Calgary just doesn't seem to have any work ethic whatsoever and that's you know and they're just simply out talenting teams which is awesome but you need to actually put the work in for those times when you you know you, your skilled players might not be having a great game but through course of work you can actually earn those victories instead of you know surrendering three goals at a time well let's chat about the next game this game was the first of the road trip on the 10th uh, the Flames went to Dallas to play the Dallas Stars and ended up winning in a uh, shootout. Johnny Goudreau got a nice goal here. It was a 3-2 victory for the Flames. Flames' goals in the third came from Elias Lindholm, his second, and Noah Hannafin, his second. Um, Matt, overall here, I thought better, much better game than the L.A. game, but still that drive didn't seem to be there for the Flames. And that was a big thing that I found in this one. Just again, they didn't seem like they showed up in, in Dallas ready to play. No, they had a better start than the L.A. game, obviously. They actually played hockey in the first period. But uh, they just didn't seem to get anything going until, once again, they're down 2 nothing. They weren't winning the races. And they weren't doing all the little things they no. needed to. And they got two fortunate bounces uh, that resulted in the goals for. And, you know, and that was hard work and talent and all that. But it, it's like you have the game against L.A. where you pretty much got embarrassed, frankly, by going down early and, you know, having to fight all the way back. And then you follow that up with basically the same game where you're not playing very well disorganized right until the third period when you get down to nothing and then oh we got to play hockey again and oh it's tied okay and then they kind of played sloppy the rest of the game and it's and that's what disappointed me is after that la game i expected them to answer back with a great game and we didn't get that. No. And credit to Dallas. They are a very good team. And they should be one of the top four or five teams in the West this year. But you look for more than that. And yeah, the it's great that the Flames won the skills competition and got the extra point out of the deal. But it was very disappointing. And it and I like I after this game I even thought to myself yeah there's if they continue to play like this there's no way that they're going to beat either Vegas or San Jose. Well, I hate to say it, but the, I mean you know we'll take a win the way we can get it. A win's a win, but they didn't deserve this win in Dallas. No, like frankly they should be one four and one. Actually, they should be one five and zero. Oh, to be frank, with the only win coming against Vancouver, every other game they deserve to lose. Like it, it's they've been bad. Well, let's talk about the next game. The next game, the Calgary Flames uh, went to Las Vegas to take on the Golden Knights, a team that we knew they'd have some issues with. We knew the team would struggle a little bit against the Knights. They're expected to be a top team 
in the West and in the Pacific and probably the a lot of people say the other team that might be fighting for that top spot in the Pacific division. And we got trounced six, two by the Knights. Um, Flurry made 33 saves. This was the fifth straight time that the flames have lost in Vegas. And to me, more of the same. I mean, you know, it was nice to see Anderson get his first goal. That was a nice goal. But again, the flames weren't winning the battles. They, the compete level didn't look like it was there. Vegas was, there's a lot of times, and you've heard me say this before, Calgary was not keeping the puck in the O-zone. Like, there's so many times a guy would try to be fancy, pass back to the D-man, they let it go past the blue line, all the way out, all the way back in. Like, it's just stuff like that where, you know, it's sloppy play, and you, it, you're you wasting way too much time. Um, Calgary also had way too many giveaways, I thought, in this one. Like, every time I looked over, it seemed like we were giving the puck to the Golden Knights. Yeah, and... Like, especially after the Flames went up 2-1 in the game, it, which was kind of unexpected at that rate, it, it's like they just, oh, well, we got it in the bag. And, like, the other, they just stopped playing any with any cohesion at all, and the Knights just are like, oh, thank you for giving us the two points. And they didn't even look good in the first. The Flames seemed like they came out in the second started to play, got their goals, and then started playing like crap again. Yeah. And, like, this team is really, like... The thing that I get concerned about with this team is, you know, last season's playoffs were, frankly, as embarrassing of a playoff series as I have seen any team go through practically since I've been a fan. Like, there's only a couple of other instances coincidentally the tampa series that that wrapped up right around the same time was one of them but like you you have to go fairly far back to find as embarrassing of a series for a team and you know and like the next season you're expecting well hey we thoroughly embarrassed ourselves Let's show that that was just a fluke and not, you know... Well, not just expecting. That's what the rhetoric's been. Management has said the players feel like that. The players have said that. Like, it's not just us guessing. Everybody's come out and said, we're disappointed by the way this thing ended. Yeah. And so then to start the season, you know, and, like, the quality of the opponents has just been okay. Like, frankly, between the six games, they should have gone probably three and three, four and two. You know, if things were going, like, at full speed. Like, you know, it's just frustrating because, the, like, that's what you would expect a team that was actually frustrated and ticked off at how they played. That they'd be getting their act together and playing with heart and determination to correct things. And instead, there it... I'm literally with each of these games other than the Vancouver game it I feel as if I've been watching reruns of the playoff series yeah I think that's a fair way to say it and like it's the same like response instead of dictating the play because they're good enough where they can just dictate the play and beat anybody it's like they're playing scared and like making basic errors that it's like but why, <laughs> you know? And well, and you and I talked about this last year too, that the Flames seem to come out and let the other team decide the tempo we're going to play at. And then the Flames will match that tempo if they stay at that tempo. Sometimes they'll even drop past that tempo when the Flames need to be coming out and saying, this is our game. We're going to play it this way at this speed. Keep up. Yeah, I know. And I and think, honestly, that's what we saw Vegas doing. Yeah. And you can see what, which teams are the actual contenders and the pretenders. And those that lead end up being the teams that are actually tough to play against. Like, frankly, from what I've seen of this team, like if we played Vegas in the postseason, like say, assuming a second round matchup between those two teams, like honestly, it's going to be a sweep for Vegas. Like, it, you know, because there's just no heart there. And it's... And, like, frankly, I don't even see the Flames making it out of the first round if they continue to play like this because, you know, they have to learn to have that killer instinct and 
set the the pace which is weird because a lot of times during last season they were doing just that you know sometimes they were playing reactive but when they were especially good at for long stretches of the season they were just dictating how the game was going and this is how we're playing and too bad you deal with it and yeah when they were good but i found too often they would just come out and let the other team set the pace yeah and, and then it wouldn't be till you know midway through the second they're like okay this is the way we're gonna play now yeah it it's just frustrating because like when the flames play like they can they are virtually unbeatable it's just like I, I don't understand why things are so out of sorts with this team especially because you know, like you look at the talent the, like say tj brody being on the third pairing well, he's a quality number two, three defenseman in the NHL. And yet, the Flames have enough talent where he's on the number five spot. And the forward group has enough talent where... And the goaltenders are decent. So, like, there's no real excuse for any of this at all. Like, it, it it's just frustrating. Because, like, I could understand, like, if, oh, we have only three guys that can actually do anything. But we don't like we have four explainable bad start yeah like it's just shocking that they're as bad as they are right now well let's chat about the next game which i thought actually was a turning point for the team even though they didn't win this one they lost 3-1 to san jose i thought honestly this was the best game of the week and probably even better than the game that she won in dallas um yeah there's there's three goals there's a back-to-back talbot had his first start I don't think, first off, you can hang any of those three goals on no. Cam Talbot. What do you think? No. Uh, you know, the first goal, it goes off the guy's foot and into the net. What do you do? The third goal, it's a two-on-one pass across one-timer that beats virtually every goaltender in the NHL. So, you know, those two goals. The, the second one was just a normal goal. So, like, it, yeah, like, I... I can't blame Talbot. I thought he had a strong game, frankly. And, like, I don't have any problem with him being in net at any point at all. I uh, would actually start Talbot again on Tuesday night against Philly just because I thought that his game overall was probably stronger than we've seen Riddick play so far. And maybe it's time to give Talbot a couple starts. Yeah, I, and I would like to see that, actually, just because he played well enough where... If the Flames had got bounces, they would have won that game, and like he would have got the win. And I don't, I don't think it's fair to hang that one on him. No, and I'm not saying Riddick's played bad games. I just don't look at a game and say, "Wow, Riddick's played well here," except for the Vancouver game. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think maybe if Talbot's looking good, give him another start. Yeah. Well, but when I look at the San Jose game, I mean, I'm seeing here. I I wrote down the Flames actually played a good game. Their last penalty kill wasn't, or their last power play was no good, but they took no bad penalties. The execution was way better. They were winning the races. They were winning the puck battles. The top line was good. They created a bunch of chances. Um, and the 3M line was good. Like, all the things that we've said are the keys to the Flames game in the past seem to be going right for them here. Yeah, and it's like what Peter Marr used to say, where teams tend to lose be when they're on a winning streak before they actually lose games and they start winning games before they actually go on a winning streak and like the san jose game felt like a win even though it was a loss and they were doing all the right things and if they keep that up they'll win most of the games it's just like that that was kind of the performance that i was expecting through all of the six games to start the season where they're doing everything tactically correct, and yeah, you're going to lose games every once in a while. Like, that one was basically bad bounces that ended up not going their way, frankly. And the Sharks capitalized on the couple of chances they had. The Flames didn't on theirs. And that's basically what it boiled down to. And if they continued to play like that, that's more indicative of a team that's doing the right things. It's just, it's frustrating when you, at any point, you don't know exactly what you're going to get. Like, when you play Boston, you know exactly what game you're getting. 
and it doesn't matter what game of the season, they might lose the game, but you know what you're getting from Boston. You know what you're getting from Toronto. You you know what you're getting from any of the good teams. But Calgary, it's literally a mixed bag. You might get the we're just awesome and we'll murder you team or what we saw in Vegas or LA. Yeah, and, and, that's, and if you want to be a top team, I think that right now all we can say is you have to be consistent. Mm-hmm. And that's not what we're seeing here. Like I said, I thought – I thought the Flames played good enough against San Jose to win. And if they can keep playing that way, I mean, there's some tweaks. It wasn't a perfect game. There's some tweaks they need to make. But if they can play between that and their Vegas game, they're going to win more often than they're going to lose. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it. it's just they need to get the good habits going and get mad at themselves when they get out of the good habits. And correct things and like we see teams like the perennial successful teams like boston where they do get into little lulls but they snap themselves out of it rather quickly and like they don't really you don't really see boston going on a five game losing streak or where they look terrible for a whole stretch of games like they might have a bad game here and there but they're fairly consistent and Matt, as you and I have talked about, we can't rely on the seven-game or eight-game win streak to pull us out of the gutter. Like, how often have we seen the Flames been, you know, bottom of the league, second last in the league, they've won seven games, they've got back into a playoff picture, and still blown it. Like, we need to be consistent every night. We can't hope that, oh, well, this team will just, you know, find seven or eight wins in a row, and that'll, that'll salvage things. Yeah, and... Like, this team has enough talent where they should be one of the top teams. But you also have to put in the effort to get there. And, you know, of course it's early in the season and you got new faces, blah, blah, blah. But you have to be starting to get the good habits and do the little things correctly. And, like, even when things aren't going like that. This is one of the reasons why I was disappointed by losing Garnett Hathaway, and he. It sounds stupid, but as a fourth liner, he was very consistent, pretty much all season long, just playing his game, and he, you know, there was no real up and downs with Garnett Hathaway. He was just always that guy, and. That's one of the things that the whole team seems to not have is just that internal consistency of doing the little things correctly. And it's frustrating because, you know, talent-wise they have it. It's just doing just the simple things right all the time. And they, they get into bad habits and things go off the rails and... You know, it's... Well, t- talking about consistency, here's an interesting stat. If we look at sort of the modern Calgary Flames since the, let's call it since the start of the Pacific Division in 2013-2014, uh, the Flames made the playoffs in 2014-15, lost in the second round. The next year, they had a bad season, didn't make the playoffs, fired Coach Hartley. The following season, Glenn Gullitson came in. We made the playoffs in 16-17, lost in the first round. The next season, had a bad record. Team team seemed to tune out Coach Gullitson, fired him. Last season, 2018-2019, we lost in the first round to Bill Peters. This season, not off to a great start, but it seems like every year we make the playoffs, the next season the Flames seem to sort of tune out the coaching staff and not do well. Do you think we're panicking by starting to think that way, or do you think we're starting to see that pattern emerge of, you know what, these guys just don't seem to want to be coached so far? Well, it's, of course, very early to be you know, lighting your hair on fire with anything like For this. For sure. And I think it's an interesting stat, and that's why I wanted to bring it up. Yeah, and the it's an if-then. If this continues and they either squeak into the playoffs barely, like in 6th, 7th, or 8th, or they miss outright, then you have personnel issues where it's the character of the players that's at fault and then you start making changes therein. Um, because if they can't bring themselves up 
like where you you know you have a coach for a year you listen to him and then you turn him out and you know and bill peter's system works perfectly well like there's no problem with what he did last year team had their second best season in franchise history so you know he's obviously doing something right it's just like if that that was the case and the flames struggle mightily or miss outright then you have to start looking at moving key personnel not just you know shuffling I, I think if the flames don't make it this year tree living's going to be out of here yeah and i wouldn't be shocked if several of the more name-ish players get dealt as well and in a like full retool yeah, I mean it's not what we need, but it's probably what we what we what we deserve at that point. Yeah, because like you can't carry on with a team that's literally going up and down like a toilet seat. Like you know, it's it, you just can't have that where you don't know what you're getting. Like that that it's like why be a fan of this team? Because like even if they have success in the regular season, they're gonna lose in the playoffs, and you know like it's. You know, you have to make modifications if that were the case. Well, I just thought it was interesting streak that, you know, every second year we seem to tune out the coach and the coach is gone. So this is the second year. So I'm kind of, I'm not worried yet, but I just wanted no. to start, bring it up and seed it in the minds of Flames fans that watch for that this year. Cause his, and, and really the same core has been here for a lot of those years. Mm -hmm. So watch, you know, this core and how they react this year. But I think you said it well, Matt. Don't panic yet. Like, we're five games in. Edmonton is, you know, winning five games. We know that's not going to last, and I'm confident that the Flames will pick this up. You and I talk all the time about, you know what, this team's a slow starter. And last year, they didn't get off to that slow start. It looks like they will this year. Well, it's the, a uh, long the, season. Well, the thing is that they actually did kind of get off to a slow start last year. They started the year 5-5-1, five, five, and one, which isn't particularly great. Yeah, no, it's it's not, but it's even in those. I mean, they didn't look as bad. I mean, there's that what that Pittsburgh game early. They looked terrible, and they started to get things going after that. Yeah, well, it was even uh, games leading up into that. There was a game against Montreal where they looked terrible. Then it was the Rangers game That's where they true. looked terrible, and then it was the Penguins I remember game the Montreal that they looked game, yeah. absolutely. And so, and it was very I, much li like this week of hockey where like they just were completely out of it, and you know then the the nine one game happened and the wheels completely fell off the wagon and you know they the team responded from that point forward. It's just we have to see if what you know if that will repeat itself and. To one benefit for the Flames is that their upcoming schedule is rather light on good teams right through the middle of November. Yeah, that's true. I mean, there's still 77 games left. There's a lot of hockey to go. You're right. They do have a fairly light schedule. There's a few games that are, you know, must wins, or I'd say, you know, maybe not must wins, but good meter stick games to test where we're at. But I think, yeah, they, they've got some time to get going. But I think the Pacific Division is going to be a couple teams in this year that we have to stay competitive with, and if we get down too early, too many too early, it's going to be tough to be competitive there. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And it was the same thing last year with the Battle of San Jose and Vegas. What that pretty much went right down to the wire. Um, and it, I don't see San Jose being anywhere near as good this year. Um. They, they just, they don't, they look like a shell of their former self, and losing Pavelski really seems to have hurt the team. Um, but I think that us and Vegas are going to be going back and forth with each other all year, and it'll, I think it'll be virtually the same story as last year with San Jose, where it's going to be right down to the wire. It's, you know, the Flames, at least like with their upcoming schedule, it, if they can start doing the correct things and start getting on a roll, like they can go on a protracted winning period of hockey, not necessarily winning every game, but a large stretch of the games where like they're playing a lot of mediocre hockey teams, frankly, over the next month and a bit. And I'm not even, 
I'm not even worried necessarily about them winning. I know that sounds bad. I'm worried about them playing, as we've talked about, consistent hockey at a high level. Not consistently bad, but consistent hockey that looks like the top of a of the Western Conference. And I think even if they don't win, wins will come. But they've got to start playing 60 minutes of hockey. I mean, I tweeted before the Dallas game, if the Flames can play three third periods, they'll win. They've got to play like that third period every, you know, in the games they're doing well in every period. And if they can start putting those games together, the wins will come. So to me, it's not even about we have to win this coming week. No. It's about let's play 60 minutes of good hockey. Yeah. And that it one follows the other. Like if you're doing all the little things right and uh, with each of the players, it, it, even if it's a small little defensive things where it, like most fans wouldn't even notice like him just being in the right spot to edge a guy off or this or that, just the little attention to detail. If you're doing those things consistently well, you will win the games more often than not, just because you're making the other team have to beat you. And, you know, anytime you have to make, like, have the other team have to beat you, then you're going to be winning most of those games. It's, like, I, like when Chicago was really on the top of their game, like, they would make virtually zero mistakes in a game. Like, they would make some, but it, compared to the average team, it was virtually spotless. And you'd have to make the exceptional play to get a goal. And sometimes, like, the Flames would beat Chicago in that, and that was awesome when they would, but they would have to have players make those exceptional plays. Well, if you can force the other teams to have to make those exceptional plays in order to beat you, instead of Kachuk at the blue line saying, here, have a two-on-one shorthanded, you know, like, it, it, you know, it's situations like that where it's, like he has to tighten up like even in a situation like that where he turned it over he could have easily dumped it back down the ice towards Talbot or something instead of coughing it up and just little things where possession is the key and if the Flames can turn that around they'll be good it's just that they have to start instilling those very good habits in their game nothing's working right now i think we can probably agree with that do you think it's time that the flames come out this week looking at some of the games we have against philadelphia detroit la and anaheim maybe with some different looks to their lines we've heard the flames talk coming into the season about how they'd like to try elias lindholm um at center do you think maybe we need to start shuffling things up maybe goudreau monahan kachuk is the first line um moving lindholm to that second line or do you think we need to sort of keep things the way they are until we work through the slump? That's the frustrating part, and why I'm upset at Sam Bennett uh, for getting in his own way is that if he was playing well on the second line, you could get away with Lindholm being on the second line as the center and with Kachuk, and you could cycle Bennett either onto the first line or the second line as the right winger on that line, and find a right winger for the second line, whether it be for Leek or Manjapane, and then have the third line being Backland for Leek and somebody. And, like, it would solidify your centers a lot better. Because Backland as a second line center is over his head a bit. Not much, but he's inadequate as a second line center. And for Leek shouldn't be on the second line. And if the Flames could well, we've push... We've seen Frolik playing on the fourth line sometimes this week. Yeah. It, like, if we can push those guys down to the third line, which is where they should, frankly, be, we just need to find some wingers to play on the... Fr right wingers on the first and second line. And if Bennett can go there, great. If Manjapane can, great. Like, I, I'm not a adverse I to I don't trying... know I'm ready to put Manjapane up there yet. I know it's one of those where he's not looked bad when he's gotten more of an opportunity and we don't frankly have anybody else and he hasn't looked bad but to me he hasn't looked like a driver on the line he's looked like a passenger it looks like he's you know able to keep up with Kachuk and Backlund but I wouldn't say that Manjapani's driving in those plays or showing us that you know he deserves that spot I think he's just the least bad yeah and that's fine for right now like until this team 
get some cohesion going and like it, ideally like if sam bennett was playing well or you know even decently i'd have him on the first line as the right winger there and try him i i even wouldn't mind trying him there even now even though he's struggling a bit, try to get him going. I think you could put Sam on that line and give him a short leash. I mean, you and I have seen he's had good uh, co- good chemistry with Goudreau in the past, but I think you have to say, you know, as soon as you start taking bad penalties, you're going down. Yeah, and th- then have Lynn Tolmont as the second line center with Manjapane uh, to start, and then someone with... Uh, I'd probably put Reader actually with uh, Backland and Frolik as a quality shutdown line, and then the fourth line being Lucic, Ryan, and Jankowski. You've mentioned in the past wanting to try Kachuk on the right wing. Would you move him up to that first line? No, only because of the fact that uh, we need to have a second line, and like you even see that in Chicago over the years where they would not have Taze and Kane on this, the same line for large portions of the time. It basically gives you two first lines if you have Kachuk on a second line. And, you know, if you get the right personnel, like if you, say, put Lindholm with uh, Kachuk, or even drop Monahan down to the second line and put Lindholm as the center on the first line, either way, you're in effect getting two first lines and that you're one of those guys is going to get prime time against weaker defensemen because most teams only have two or three really good defensemen well that's actually what i was going to suggest i know it's going to be unpopular because breaking up johnny and Monty is not something a lot of flame fans want to think about but if you look at it if we were to have a first line of let's say goudreau lindholm at center and for the sake of argument we'll say bennett on the right if we were to then have Monahan, Kachuk, and I would even say you could even try Reader there. I would be more comfortable with Reader than Manjapani at this point. That gives you, you know, maybe Lucic, Backland, and Frolik as your third line. You you've spread out some of that talent now, and putting I think Monahan as the setup man for Kachuk could help ignite that second line. Yeah, and it would be nice to find... Because Kachuk is one of the top players in the NHL. And if he well, was He's on, definitely getting paid. I mean, he's the he's the highest paid flame ever, so he's definitely a good player. Yeah, and like if he was on any other team, he would definitely be on the first line. And the problem that he's had is that Backland and Froelich are both elite third-line players, and the Flames haven't really had any higher end talent to go with him and like even the fill-in guys that we get on the second line are guys like Dubé, Manjapane, like not high-end talent either and you know and to Trelliving's credit he did try multiple times to get guys like Zucker and Kadri to fill that spot and I think that eventually one of those things will happen and we'll get another second-line player probably towards the trade deadline. But, you know, having him have the ability to play with either Lindholm or Monaghan will help his game as well, because he's frankly doing everything himself five-on-five in terms of generating offense. And that's no slight to Backlund, but he's a high-quality second, third-line center, not, you know, a top-line guy. Well, and I even said this at one point last year. I think if you really want to be honest, um, Monaghan is a is a top end second line center. He's either a low end first line center or, a, you know, like he, he probably there's probably about eighteen centers to twenty centers in the NHL that I'd take over Monaghan. Like he's still a first line center, but that's more just because there's thirty one teams, but. He's not a high-end guy, and he's not the one elite of, our, of the elite guys. One of our issues, I'm just looking at even guys who we could stick on the right who shoot right, and I mean, we're just running out of guys who shoot right. Um, but what if, would you even consider playing Backlund off-center and play him on the wing on one of those top two lines? Like, what uh, if you were to go Kachuk, 
um, Monaghan Backland. Uh, Backland is so good defensively that I think that takes away from his game. Like, you know, uh, I agree, I, but I think then you've got, you know, your only other option, that I think you'd say the same about Ryan. So would you move Mark Jankowski to the wing then? Like we start running out of centermen at some point. Yeah. Unless we start slotting Zarnik in there. It's, it's interesting to think about, and I think it definitely shows that, you know, as we've talked about, we need a, a right winger. Yeah. And I think that there's a trade that has to be made at some point to bring in a right winger, be that a guy like Zucker or even a Kadri type. Um, but, you know, I think that we are where we have forwards in Goudreau, Monaghan, Lindholm, Kachuk. I'd even say Backland. But we're missing that that six piece for our top six. Yeah. And, like, that's why the early part of this season, frankly, until about January – is basically audition time for any of the young guys to see if they got, uh, and that includes guys like Bennett. Do you have enough to take that next step? And I think this, you know, I think at the trade deadline they are going to get somebody. And like I'm pretty much, unless the Flames well, are that might be too late, uh, in danger of. Like, even in January or February, I think they're going to be getting somebody. It's just waiting and seeing I, how, if, how... If Bennett can get better mentally and not take dumb penalties, I think the team wants him to be that top six guy. Yeah. And I think it's it's his spot, as we've seen, every time we promote him to lose it. And I think that they just keep... I mean, you can't do it too much, but they keep giving him an opportunity, and he's got to jump on it. And... You know, it, I think this year it's either we f- realize that he's top six material or we realize that he's permanent bottom six material. Yeah, like sort of like a Rafi Torres type where just a decent quality third, fourth line guy who can hit people and chip in I'd even say even, even more than Torres, I'd even say Michael Froelich, right? He could be a second line on a team that's short on guys, but... You know, he's probably, if you project him out on a good team, he's a third liner. Yeah. You know, I think Torres is, sh- is selling Bennett a little short in terms of the skill that he does have. Well, Torres was pretty good for a while. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think Torres was, Torres was always that extra plugger piece. And I think Sam has more to his game. He just needs to have limited minutes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting conundrum. And as you mentioned earlier, we did see the defensive pairs get swapped up a little bit this week. Um, you know, Gio and Anderson played together, Hannafin and Hamannick, uh, Brody and Stone were the third pair at one point. So we've seen the D get shuffled and I think it's maybe now time to start seeing the forwards get shuffled. Yeah. So I'll be really curious to see what happens um, this week, if we, even if not for a whole game, even if it, you know, the start of a game, the flames come out with different lineups. And if we need to, you can always revert back, but I think that they just need to try something a little bit different. Yeah. Well, and I'm, I've thrown this suggestion out a number of times. Who do you want to convert I'd... from D to forward now? Yep. Well, that's the thing. Um, I thought stones played rather well as the defenseman, what if you took Shillington and threw him up on the forward ranks? But I don't know if that solves things. He's still a left-handed shot. I think if they're going to do that, honestly, they take Stone, who's a right-handed shot, because they're short on right-handed shots. Yeah. I don't know. And, and the, Shillington's this... so young. They like, they like him as a young defenseman. I think that's really going to stunt his development. Yeah. Wow, I keep trying to throw that out there, you know. Every you, year, you, there's some defenseman you want to become a forward. Hey, it worked for Brent Burns for a long time. He was a winger for, like, five, six years, so, you know, it could work. If we're that, I mean, there's still some decent free agents. If we're that desperate, I'd rather go out and get one of those guys than, you know, maybe ruin the development of Shillington. True. I think Shillington's, I think Shillington's not even showing... I don't want to say this wrong because I think he's played well, but I think he's still struggling to adapt to the NHL game as a defenseman. Yeah. I think then adding the forward aspect, he's going to struggle even more. 
Yeah. You know, I mean, if I look at some of the free agents that are out there, and I'm not saying get a free agent. I don't think that's the, I don't think that that's the um, the answer. But Jason Palmanville, Thomas Vanek, like, I think there's enough serviceable right-handed shots that if you just need a right-handed shot, we could bring one in. Justin Williams, please come to Calgary. Um, you know, I would even at some point, if the if the asking price becomes low enough, look at bringing in Magnus PRV. Well. The thing is that the flame. What if you, what if you could do uh, what if you could do Jankowski or Shillington for PRV? Would you do it? Not Shillington. Um, or sorry, not Shillington. I meant uh, Zarnik. Yeah. If you could do uh, Janko or Zarnik for PRV, would you do it? Yeah, I think that uh, the Flames could easily make a lower end depth player for a lower end depth player type trade. Just swapping, you know, like other teams need centers or left wingers, they might have a surplus of right wingers. So I could definitely see something along that line. Like I just, I would rather if if you're really talking about getting desperate and moving defense to forward. I'm and I'm not saying I want to sign those guys. I'm just thinking that if you really think you need another forward, and I don't think it's about need another forward. I think it's about needing a right-handed shot, and Shillington doesn't really provide us that. True enough. You know, there's there's enough right-hand shots out there that. We can go get one, but I don't think that's the solve. But every year you need a defenseman to move forward. Maybe next year it'll be Giordano. We'll we'll see. Yeah, well, got to do something. Got to be different, you that's know. Right. Like, that, got to get creative that solutions. That seems to be every year you've got some D-man you want to convert. Yep. Creative solutions. Well, let's look ahead to see if the Flames can find a creative solution to some NHL teams this year. Um, they've got f- four games the next week, two at home, two on the road. Tuesday the 15th, they play the Philadelphia Flyers here at, in Calgary at 7 p.m. On Thursday, they play host to the Detroit Red Wings. Then on Saturday, they're on the road in, in L.A. for Drew Doughty versus Keith Kachuk round two. Oh, and by the way, the Calgary Flames will also play the L.A. Kings. And there's a back-to-back there on uh, Sunday, 7 p.m., where the Calgary Flames will take on the Anaheim Ducks in the dreaded Honda Center. Matt, we got four games in front of us. Before we make our predictions, let me ask you, who? what do you think the goalie split's going to be this week? Talbot, Riddick, Riddick, Talbot. So you think Talbot against Philadelphia, Riddick against Detroit, Riddick against L.A., and Talbot against Anaheim? Yep. I would honestly play Talbot until he doesn't look good this week. I think we've had five games with Rid- or four games with Riddick. We know what we've got there. Um, I think it's Talbot's turn, and I would even I would even play Talbot, Philly, Detroit, L.A., and then put Riddick back in Anaheim. Yeah, I could see that. It just depends on how Talbot it, plays, really. I I would keep him in that, but uh, just see. Ya. I would keep him in until he doesn't look good, or we get to the back to back, whatever comes first. Yeah. And I think it might do Riddick some good at this point to sit for a bit and, you know, rest up. Yep. Yeah. I just think if this team is going to have both guys going like they say they're going to, you can't just be given Talbot the back-to-backs. Yeah, exactly. And he looked good enough in the San Jose game that I think he should get another shot and see how it goes. Like, Riddick's only looked good for parts of the Colorado game, parts of the LA game, and parts of the Dallas game, and looked horrible against Vegas and was good against Vancouver. And... You know, if he can play like that where he's good all the time, then, of course, he'll have the number one spot. But he's been inconsistent in each game. And I think that, you know, Talbot looked reasonably good against San Jose. So I think that for his confidence, I think you need to have him go again. And I think you really need to let these guys earn the crease. You know, I think if you play a good game, you got to go again. And and it's not just, okay, Dave, it's your net. But, Dave, earn your net back. Like, he looked good for a game. We'll give him another one. When you get back in there, earn it back. I think that's the way you've got to do it this year until you establish a starter. I still think down the – and I think I said this when we first got Talbot. I could see down the stretch Talbot actually taking the starting job – if he can, you know, rise to his, say, New York level of play, I think you have to give him the option to to do that. Well, Talbot, even, like, except for last season, was one of the key players for the Edmonton Oilers. 
And, like, he was on par with McDavid in terms of importance to the team because he was bailing him out. Like, he was the only reason why they'd win games. And if he can play like that for us, like, or even remotely close to that, then we're going to be doing just fine. And you have to give him a little latitude. It's not like he's, frankly, Mike Smith, where you, you know, it's, you just kind of hope that he doesn't screw up. <laughs> yeah, you're right. And and we have yeah, I I just think we need to give him the latitude to to get going. Yep. So Matt, we got four games. How do you think this week will turn out? 4-0. Oh. You think so? Wow. Yeah. All four of the teams are kind of mediocre. Like Philadelphia is the best of the bunch and they're not going to make the playoffs this year. Uh the other three teams are bad. Uh, um or in Anaheim and LA's case, very bad. And I think that the Flames will be, like, especially after their poor start this weekend, I think they're going to be more motivated to get going. Would you say that these are the first two mediocre teams we faced this year? Uh, I'd say LA and Vancouver were mediocre. Uh, like, I don't expect either of them to be even remotely close to a playoff spot this year. So... You know that, and and really, even though we we lost the LA game and it was a bad game, Calgary still got a point out of it. Yeah, and that was more just being unprepared for LA actually trying in that game. Because when LA okay. when LA tries, they can actually play good. It's just that like most of the time, it's yeah, not so much. So it is what it is. Damn you, Matthew Kachuk. I think, <laughs> I think that Calgary is going to beat Philly and beat Detroit because, like you said, they're not great teams. They're not – Calgary tends to do well on games they don't have to win, and these are both Eastern Conference opponents, so I think they're great ways to get things going. I expect to see some experimentation on the lineups, again, because really in the grand scheme of things, these games don't have a lot of impact on the season. And I think that we'll see a win in both of the home games. I think Calgary's going to lose in L.A. I think Doughty's going to come out and try to throw the Flames off their game again. I'm not sure they're going to be ready for that. And I'm going to say that we lose in Anaheim because it's the Honda Center. Yeah. Well, it a just like you. I know. Anaheim is so terrible, though, that they really should win, even though the Honda Center thing, like, come on. But, you know, An Anaheim's terrible, but I just haven't seen enough from this team yet to say they can even beat the bad teams. I know. True enough. I might change my tune by Sunday, but where they're sitting now, I mean, the the only real hockey games I've seen so far are the Vancouver ones and the, the one against Vancouver and the one against San Jose. If they play hockey like they did the rest of these games, Anaheim's going to beat them. Oh, uh, if they play like the rest of the games, I think they might only win one game this week. If that, <laughs> so, you know, you know, and I think Anna Anaheim's also going to be sort of like you said, we weren't prepared for LA. I can see it happening with Anaheim where they're expecting a bad team. All of a sudden it's halfway through the second and we're going, Whoa, Whoa, what happened here? And, uh, you know, all of a sudden Anaheim is, is up by three goals or something. And we're having a hard time recovering. I just, yeah, I don't know. I've got a bad feeling. I've got a bad feeling about those two games. But I'm hoping that the Flames will get back on track and even be, like we talked about, even just be consistent there. Yeah. If they play like they can, th they should go 4-0. Yeah. If they play like they can, they shouldn't be down where they are right now either. True. So hopefully they re hopefully they return to playing like they themselves instead of what we've seen thus far. The The... Motto for the team the last couple of seasons has been it's go time, and I think right now it's go time. Like let's let's get this season going. Let's start showing teams that this is an elite team in the league, and let's start putting up those points. Yeah, and like you also have to put it in context. Like if you look in the East, like Tampa Bay is down near the bottom. Like they only have five points in five games, and uh, they're twelfth right now in the east and edmonton's number two yeah and carolina's the best team uh, along with buffalo in the east so yeah it's early <laughs> 
Well, before we sign off this week, I want to remind everybody, you'll do us a big favor if you can go out and rate or leave a review of the show wherever you get this podcast, be it iTunes, uh, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, uh, tune in. We're trying to get new fans to listen to Fireside Chat every season, especially with what we're anticipating to be a big season for the team. And the more you can leave those reviews, the better it is to help the show and help new people find us. So if you could take a moment this week to uh, like us, leave a review, leave us five stars, whatever you think we've earned on those platforms, we really appreciate it. We also want to remind you guys that we want to hear from you on the show. So if you have a comment, you can either send us a text message or leave us a voicemail at our phone number, 587-200-7176. That number again is 587-200-7176. And we'd love to read your stuff on the show. Also converse with us. We're at, on, on Twitter at Fireside Podcast. We're on Facebook at Fireside Chat. Those are the two best ways to get a hold of us. Let us know what you want us to talk about. Let us know if you have any burning questions. And uh, I I think it'll be a good week for us as Flames fans to interact with each other and talk about either the misery or the success that is going to be this week for the Flames. Because I think it's either all or nothing for these guys. It's going to be a great one or a a bad one. Yeah, desperation time if it's a bad one. (laughs) Exactly. Well, Matt, enjoy this week. And hopefully uh, we'll be in better spirits when we talk next week. And happy Thanksgiving to everybody, and as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.